you've got to grab them and then keep them. And so a hot open is when you get up in front of people, you turn on the Zoom, however it is, and you open hot. I did this on a, a, a on the, the TEDx presentation. I walked out on stage. I didn't say hello. I didn't say hi. My name's Mark. Walk out, hit the red dot. In February 2002, I moved to Bangkok, Thailand, following my dream of becoming a professional fighter. That was verbatim the first sentence out of my mouth. Everybody's on the edge of their seat, and then we go. Because if you lose, if you lose them from the start, or if you lose your audience somewhere along the way, it's hard to get them back. It's hard. You can you can totally do it, and it's hard to get them back. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Building Men podcast. Building men become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Joined, as always, younger brother, best friend, best friend, Anthony Miralda. Hey. What's up, brother? How you doing? How was your weekend? Oh, boy. That was a doozy. <laughs> what's a doozy? Oh, man, that's probably a great story when you say your weekend was a doozy. No, it wasn't that good. No. I, I don't think I did. Uh, it wasn't anything um, too worthy of... All nothing right, so special. nothing fucking no it, right. yeah no. no normally i would have I, there'd be barnyard animals there'd be yeah, uh there's some ky jelly barnyard animals and involved and some <laughs> waking up and not knowing how i got there and i'm half naked and that's gonna be the title of your book eventually right yeah <laughs> chapter 19 how many barn animals it happened too again many. <laughs> yeah it, it happened, it happened again, again. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're gonna be uh talking with uh, a guest that we're having back on for the second time. The first time around, it was a solo podcast. Uh, it was before you strapped it in and strapped strapped it up, joining mm-hmm. Building Men. But uh, the, our guest will be Mark England, and we'll talk about world-class presentation strategy. So I started to think about your journey. The first time that I had you on the podcast as a guest, like as a true guest, you had to get so fucked up beforehand. Like you had to drink just to be me and you on a Zoom together, right? It was, yeah. So as I'm thinking about, how we go about getting into the mindset to be ready to present. There's probably a whole thing to get ready beforehand and then actually when you're presenting and then even afterward, the reflection piece. So I'm really interested. Oh, I can't wait because this has been like such a topic for me that's like even I would think about present like presenting and I would immediately get, you know, tense and I could feel my breath start to go and everything, all that response, even without me actually being like presenting itself, just visualizing it, I couldn't even do it. And it was the story that you were telling yourself around right. the presentation. It, it stemmed back to a memory that you had, and then you just relived that memory. You were inside of that story. Yes, and for I, a long and that's, period of time. And it's amazing because I have so many other stories to go against that. But that one story is what I why I wasn't a good presenter is because of that one thing that happened in my life. And part of it was, you know, they would tell people. You would hear this all the time. You picture the audience in their underwear. You picture the audience yeah, naked. But what happens if they have a fucking huge penis and they look amazing? And I'm like, well, this is terrible. So you, now I feel even worse about you myself. You pictured yourself naked. Yeah, and everyone and I'm up there, right? On. And the little schwats as I'm up there and I'm fucking hanging out. It's so like, cold. This it's is so terrible. Cold. I swear to God, it's not usually like this. <laughs> so that didn't help. So that didn't help. So either. I'm hoping these tips are a little better. <laughs> Absolutely. So with that being said, what we're going to do now is we are going to bring on our guest for for the Building Men podcast today. His name is Mark England. He is the co-founder and head coach of the Enlifted program. He is someone we had back, we had on over the summer. And uh, since then, I've joined the Enlifted coaching certification program level one. So I see Mark every single week now. And it's, it's a tremendous honor to meet with this guy every week and bullshit with him, learn from him. And just have a good time with him. He's just a really great human being. Mark, welcome back to the Building Men Podcast. Ellis, thanks for having me back. And uh, and if anyone writes a book, either of you two write a book uh, titled It Happened Again, I'm reading that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's so interesting with the the topic of presenting, like presentation skills. We think about, and Mark, you know for a fact, like we've talked about it a lot, how I want to redo the way schools are set up. 
you know we, kids are given something to present it's like okay research this topic learn a little a bit about it and then get up in front of an audience of your peers and your teacher and talk about it and we're going to assess you on your ability to talk about it without any training without any work around the story without anything else we just push kids up into the front of an audience and all right go for it kids so we're never really taught true presentation skills how did you go about getting that into part of what you wanted to do was understand one that you had the um, capacity or propensity to be in front of an audience and then how did you just start understanding that you needed to hone those skills out of, out of need man out of sheer need uh i started presenting in 2007 uh as a way to um uh enroll people into my one-on-one -on -one coaching it was uh i, I had this the the 7 p.m slot every Wednesday night at the spa and I would do a one hour presentation, uh, on, on story work. And, uh, <laughs> my first 20 were horrible. Um, I, I, I clearly remember, uh, the, those icy beads of sweat that start forming on your forehead when you get up in front of people for the first time and you're an amateur. And I've got a list, a very well-defined list of what separates the amateurs from the professionals when it comes to giving presentations. It has nothing to do with getting paid. We're going we're gonna to absolutely go into that in, in detail. And for the first 20, 25, maybe 30 presentations, I did all, I did everything wrong. I was a total amateur and I suffered miserably for it, but I kept going. Remember that the, uh, the, the enlisted super secret formula for success, you start and you keep going. Um, when I got off stage, we did a TEDx, uh, R RVA, which stands for Richmond, Virginia, which at the time, I didn't know this, uh, at the time they only, they did five years in a row. TEDx RVA was in the top 10 uh, Ted X's on the planet for, and there's about 5,000 for production value, uh, and, 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 and delivery. And I gave, I, I did a TEDx presentation in, in, Jan, in June of 2017. I got off stage. That was my 500th presence presentation. I stopped, I stopped counting and I learned some things along that, on, along the way. Um, first and foremost, is that uh, uh, presentations, you can have fun up there. That's the craziest thought for most people, that they could enjoy themselves in front of a group of people, on a podcast, giving a workshop. Most people are praying for a sliver of confidence when it, when it comes to getting up in front of people. And there's a whole other world past that. Uh, and And before we get into those the specifics about amateurs and professionals um you know what you mentioned earlier is is i do yes yes fine i'm the head coach of enlifted i deliver all the trainings and certifications um and i do a little bit of one-on-one -on -one coaching on the side only on one topic only presentation skills and half the people that i work with they've got a memory from school when in fourth fifth grade whatever they were given a topic to research uh, a certain amount of time to get up and present about it uh and no presentation skill training whatsoever and it it sets up a real block in people that's a very i mean i experienced that it was terrifying how many times did y'all get up in front of your classmates when you were small and all their eyeballs on you and it's just it's it's an awkward weird situation and sometimes it that's the evidence that people use to tell themselves they're not a good speaker into their adult life. They're using something from the fifth grade as proof that they're, they're they, they, I'm, I'm not going to get up there and talk. Right. And you think it's, about it's super quite common. Shit. Think about what we're what the kids are learning in fifth grade. 
you know, they're, they're learning about the 50 nifty states in the United States and memorizing every single fucking capital. Why not spend a quarter of the year in fifth grade yeah. just teaching the kids how to speak publicly? That's where we should start it, way back in elementary school. Because, you know, then, then the thing is, then they have the script in front of them. Yeah. So they're, they're actually reading it from a piece of paper. And you think about the story work that you do, it's how do you take the paper and move it away from your face a little and bit And it's further. not even a course that we need to to take right a public speaking course like when did that first get introduced i feel like it was college, college that you even learn they even have a class based off of public speaking and yet you are required to do public speaking throughout school all the time and then you have all these instances of not learning how to present having no idea what the hell you're doing and going into it and failing along the way and feeling dejected and yep. then having this evidence like i'm not good enough i'm not good enough and all of a sudden you're an adult and you the only stories that you have are that you didn't do well. Absolutely. You didn't, it didn't, you know, it didn't go the way that you planned it to go. So before we jump back into that mindset of elementary school, Mark, that you were just referring to, I just need to publicly comment. The first thing that I watched of you was vocabulary, and just seeing the the transition of the way that you presented and i think it has to do with the growth of the beard at the same time i was just gonna I say if you the, don't mention uh, it, i have to just acknowledge just can the, i just say how phenomenal you look right now i'm just gonna throw that out there yeah so <laughs> you're gonna be chapter 20 and it happened again yeah uh-oh <laughs> i can't believe it happened again yeah. <laughs> chapter 20 yeah <laughs> it, it, yeah the beard has something to do with it adam chin uh, uh yeah, thank you, thank you. There, there's, it's, it's as it it, 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 it comes in the, you know, the character comes alive, and you know, if you're gonna play in the language space, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a wizard, you know, grow, grow something out, man. You know, grow a beard, get wizardy. Love that. Get yeah, wizardy. Absolutely. And I had a beard back. It was my 40th birthday. I'll be 45 in a week and a half. And my 40th birthday, I had a, I had a substantial beard. It, it was, was a good beard. It yeah. had some, you know, it could food could get stuck in there for a week, and I wouldn't know. That's how. Mm. That's what was going on with the beard. It wasn't a Dave Robinson beard. It wasn't no, to that level. No, it, it was. It was definitely. It had some, uh, you know, girth. Yeah, it. It, was yeah it had some. It had some legs. Yeah. So now, Mark, we're back in elementary school, right? And so you know, kids are are learning what not to do by being pushed out in front of the in front of the audience. They're not quite sure what's going on. I, but I do believe you you said at the beginning you there were 25 times it sucked and I I honestly believe you have to have that shit version you have to you know sack up and have that shit version one of the things that you recommend that we read that we read as part of Enlifted was the talent code by um, Daniel Coyle and he yeah. talks about the myelin in your brain and you have to go through the process of of deep intentional practice with everything you're doing and that's how you get better at a lot of these things and i would think presenting has that same idea of that deep intentional practice um around the topic of of presentation skills 100 percent, 100 percent. um everything is, I, I know how to get i know how to get good at things now and because i understand the beginning process uh i'm um uh Right now, the thing that I'm practicing the most is is firearms training. I did uh, a competition this past weekend, and I've done four or five of them, uh, defensive pistol matches. They're a lot of fun. And I went to a, a, a different place this, this past weekend, and the level of competition was 16, 16 times what I'm used to. I came in last, like not even last, like beyond last in every single event and i loved it see i've i've i've, I've put a put i've connected a couple of dots uh and that is if i put myself in positions around people that are way better than me at something and i relax and i breathe i get better faster one of the fastest ways to stay bad at something is to hold your breath while you're learning it Okay. Listening faculties go down. We get tunnel vision. We keep that tension and that stress in, in, in our body. Um, and and what, what faster way to pucker somebody up, pucker a little kid up, get them tense and breath trapped is to, is to put them in front of their peers. It's terrifying. That's judgment central. Um, and, and the first 25 
presentations that that I gave, I made the fatal mistake, the number one thing that amateurs do. So everybody, get your pen and paper. I'm about to dump two columns of information about amateurs and about professionals when it comes to presentation skills. And this will be as valuable of a a 30 minute breakdown of presentation skills as you're gonna find anywhere. I've coached a lot of people from terrified to having fun on stage. That is absolutely the goal and enjoying yourself because a couple of things before we get into it, it's undeniable when someone is up in front of a group of people and they're enjoying themselves. It's absolutely undeniable and it's powerful and it's magical. And learning to tell stories, this is all, it's all storytelling. Presentation skills is storytelling. Um, it's one of the very best skills that someone can uh, uh, acquire for themselves. If you want to become a leader in any field, one of the fastest ways to do that and be seen as such is to get up in front of people and educate them and entertain them. The first, so write the word amateur, underline it. Over on the other side of the page, write the word professional and underline it. The first first things first with amateurs, they, and I did this 25 times before finally I learned, they do not prepare. They do not prepare. They die a miserable death up there thinking, I'll know what to say when I get in front of everybody. Or I know what I'm going to present. I've got it in my head. When it's, I've seen, and I've, I've paid, I've paid the price. I've seen so many people that were skilled, that knew what they were talking about, get up in front of a group of people. And because they were unprepared in how to tell the story of what they were an expert in, lock up, seize up and, 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 and deliver poorly. Professionals, on the other hand, they prepare. First things first, how are you going to start? So over, over on the amateurs, okay, and for, for a lack of preparation, they don't know how they're going to start. So write cold open. It's called a cold open. And I'm going to give you all a cold open. Um, let's, let's pretend I, I get in front of a group of people. Hey, everybody. Um, my name's Mark, and I just want to let you know that uh, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, you know, being here today. We've got a lot of a lot of great stuff to talk about, and I, I, I appreciate your time. And you know, with the everything that we're going to go over today is, uh, you know, it's 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 really interesting. It's made a, a really big impact in my life, and um, uh, you know, I just I, again, I want you to, I want I want to let you know this is a really big honor to be here. In front. I just lost everybody. Everybody's thinking about checking their notifications on Facebook. You've got to grab them and then keep them. And so a hot open is when you get up in front of people, you turn on the Zoom, however it is, and you open hot. I did this on, a, 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 on the, the TEDx presentation. I walked out on stage, I didn't say hello, I didn't say hi, my name's Mark. Walk out, hit the red dot. In February 2002, I moved to Bangkok, Thailand, following my dream of becoming a professional fighter. I was verbatim the first sentence out of my mouth. Everybody's on the edge of their seat, and then we go. Because if you lose, if you lose them from the start, or if you lose your audience somewhere along the way, it's hard to get them back. It's hard. You can you can totally do it, and it's hard to get them back. You, uh, go ahead. You had me at Bangkok. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah, what a city! And that was how we we. That was the, the the music that we introed the last time you were on the podcast. I that was one of the first things that I said to you instead of "Hey, welcome aboard." I'm like, you gotta fucking tell me about Bangkok. That city sounds like from the Dude. song. I'm like, do you remember the song Murray Head? You're like, holy shit, Murray Head. Yeah, absolutely. So that's how and that's what yep. it, it drew me into the TEDx talk was you starting in that way. It wasn't a passive opening. It was once you said it, I'm like. The fuck is this guy? I, I I need more of whatever he's selling to me right now. I need more of whatever this message is. 
yeah that that song i remember i remember hearing that song at the pool when i was like eight or nine and one night in bangkok makes a hard man humble Da-na. and then and I, it, I painted the the craziest picture in my head as a little kid it's, it's spooky when i think about it of of this place being like the the hardest city on the the planet it looked like blade runner in my head uh, and and I ended up living there. I lived in Thailand for ten years. Five of those years were in Bangkok. Turns out, chapter twenty, uh, chapter twenty one. It happened again. Two. One night in Bangkok. One night in Bangkok. <laughs> yeah. One, one, one Saturday night in Bangkok. <laughs> um, it, yeah. Shout out to shout out to everybody in Thailand, man. I, I, I will. Uh, one of the best moves I ever made. On a side note, everybody, go travel. Go travel. Um, the second thing that amateurs do really, really well because they're stressed, because they have not prepared, is they talk too fast. They get up there and they're stressed. Breath is trapped in the chest and they start talking quickly. When someone jams themselves in that upregulated, fast talking uh, uh, state, you lose you lose range okay and a lot of times it compounds itself it turns it snowballs itself turns into um you you lose control of the storytelling mechanism what you want to do professionals on the other hand they speak at around 80 percent of their normal rate of speech i was uh um uh, i would have gone i would have gone before if i had known about it Jonesboro. They do it in Jonesboro, Tennessee, the the National Storytellers Convention. I went there in 2019 with my buddy, and they get the best storytellers that they can find. And they have a 5,000 person tent. They have a 6,000 person tent. They've got all these other tents. Uh, and and what I was suspicious of, and my suspicions were confirmed, is that these people, they're going to tell their stories slow, and they're going to be simple. Okay, and it was—I uh, was right on part. It, it were just smooth and easy to follow along. When someone starts talking fast and they keep talking fast, because what you want to do, when what one of the many blessings of slowing down your rate of speech when you're presenting is that you're going to breathe well. You're going to breathe well, and whether it's a it's a sales pitch or you're asking someone out on a date or it's a presentation, or fill it in. If you're breathing in your chest, everybody's going to pick up on it. When you deliver a presentation, you want to be breathing from your abdomen. You will literally sound different. You will deliver a different message. And you will also give yourself access to go high when you need to, to get, get really excited and talk about the really cool things when it's time to talk about them, and then also to bring it down low and make some important points. And and so you turn it into a heartbeat instead of a flat line. Another thing that amateurs do, because they have not prepared and they're stressed out uh, and they're not breathing well and they have very little mental real estate to pay attention to their what? Their hands. Amateurs, amateurs, pick and scratch they're like they're, they're 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 doing this and they don't know where their hands are going your body is whether you're on a zoom call or you're in front of people live your body is just as important in the storytelling process as the words that you're saying professionals on the other hand they own their hands okay? and if you own your hands you own your feet if you go out there and you breathe well and you put a smile on, and you know what your hands are doing, and you know what your feet are doing, you're now orchestrating the the, the experience for your audience. Uh, uh, an, another thing, the, so the, the, the next one down for amateurs, they pack too many things into the presentation, okay? 17 things to change your life. You mean I'm going to get nothing. Like, okay, you want one through line. You want one main theme.
theme through the presentation, and then you feed back into that with storytelling. Uh, and this is on a side note. Um, I've seen professionals do this too. If you want to bore your audience, everybody, okay, give them too many statistics, okay? Give them a lot of statistics and use a lot of slides, okay? When, when I'm coaching people for presentation skills and the, the conversation about using slides come up, uh, I say, as a last resort, and if you do, make them uh, uh, make them very impactful, make them very important, and use them sparingly. Because a lot of people, they use slides to distract the audience from focusing on them, okay? You want the audience to focus on you, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, and so, again, amateurs, they, they, they put too many things into the presentation. They, they make it complicated, Professionals, they distill it down to a very simple message, and they support that very simple message from a variety of different angles. Uh, uh, and then, then the next thing, next thing uh, that, that amateurs do uh, really, really well, they don't close well. Okay, so they'll go over in in in, in as far as the time is concerned. They'll go over the clock. You've heard me say this, Dennis. Pros own the clock. You want to close well. You want to have an ask. Okay, what do you want your audience to do? Um, give them one task to do: to sign up for your newsletter, to remember to drink water in the morning, call their grandparents, whatever it is. Okay, remember to get the soft talk out of their language which is very frequently the, the, the thing that I close podcasts with. Uh, and, and, and then you want to close emotionally. You want to tell a story at the end of the presentation that engages the audience. Well, first and foremost, your emotions. You don't want to tell a story that you go completely, you know, a, a thousand percent emotional on. You want to tell something that gets you misty eyed. And if you've taken them on that ride, you've gotten, you've, 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 you've captured their attention, you've entertained them, okay? At the very end, you tell a story where you can get a little bit emotional about it, not overly, a little bit of emotion, that seals the deal. And, and once again, if, if you all, uh, anyone can get better at presentation skills, a thousand percent, anybody can. It's quite easy, actually, if you go about preparing and the the um, I'm repeating myself on purpose. The the name of the game is to get up there and be free. To get up there and have fun. To get up there and enjoy yourself. And because I, I tell this, the the coaches this a lot, you never know who's in the audience. You never know who's in the audience. One presentation, one podcast. I mean, we did this when when Barbell Shrug. In 2017, March 2017, that was by far the biggest show we had gone on. When that dropped, everything changed for us. One podcast. I know I'm talking a lot. No, it's it's interesting. As you're talking, Mark, I'm thinking back at my experience as an educator, watching kids do presentations. Again, we'll, we'll bring it back to there and then work toward people that are now in, in their professional lives or even personal lives are presenting on a regular basis. The slides thing is what got me. I think back to watching kids present using slides and there was everything that they said was typed out in a slide and there were there were a million graphics. And not only that, and I remember, and I don't know if you remember this, Anthony, doing presentations yourself on say PowerPoint, Every letter would come in individually when I say a sixth grade kid was doing a presentation. It would do like that and there'd swipe. be a sound effect. It would be like yeah. pew, 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 pew. Yeah. and it would Each come across would the... come in and it was distracting the audience from the actual message and they were using the screen as a crutch. And now we all see it. Zoom has become such a part of our lives. We know when there's someone who is skilled in the way of presenting where if there's something that pops up on the screen, it draws our attention in so much because that is not what it, it, it isn't what has happened for the last half hour. All of a sudden, something's on the screen. It draws our attention to that specific thing. It 
conjures up some kind of an emotion with us and then brings it back to the, whoever the presenter is. So that resonated with me as I'm, as I'm going through this journey with you thinking about how I saw it translate into kids presenting uh, for themselves in front of a group of people. Yeah, 100%. 100%. The slide thing, that's a real thing. Um, you know, and and frame, let's give a shout out to uh, uh, the, 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 the book, The Talent Code, Daniel. You're going to fail, okay? You're going to get up there and you're going to get stuck. At some point in time in your career as a presenter, it's going to happen, okay? See that as an inevitability, okay? And use it as, so there's a saying in fighting, either you win or you learn, okay? And, and I know full well that, that, that sometimes when the record scratches, when you're given presentations, that, uh, that, is, that, is, that is not fun. Uh, I was, what, about 200 presentations deep giving a, an intro talk. So I was in Istanbul, this was 2011, and we were doing a, a very high end. It was, we, everybody in the, the, the audience was essentially the elite, the elites of Istanbul, elites of Turkey. They were into the yoga scene. And it was a weekend workshop, story work and yoga, which is a great pair, by the way. And um, I'm, I'm the main attraction. So the person who's organizing it, puts everybody gets it gets everybody there and i'm supposed to tell everybody what what we're going to do and why they'd want to come you know sales and about 10 minutes in i just drew blank straws i drew a blab 10 seconds everybody <laughs> 10 seconds of dead air on a podcast that's a thing 10 seconds of dead air in front of a group of people especially when there's a, a, a decent dollar amount on the line uh uh and in people's reputations and stuff and i never recovered i never recovered uh people i just picked a story and started talking about something i don't even remember it was, it was terrifying and people got up and they they started leaving and and uh i got i once once we wrapped i got out and i was like what just happened and one thing you can do okay here's a super pro move if you get stuck okay what you want to do when you're presenting whether you're uh, on stage or you're on a podcast and let's just say you get stuck You do that right there. You want to have a bottle of water next to you, folks. Or I've done this on stage. You take a stool and you put it off towards on the side of the stage and you put a bottle. I just, I, for those of y'all that are listening or just listening, I just took a sip out of my glass of water. Uh, and I'll, you, you take a stool and put it over on the side of the stage and put a bottle of water on it. And if you get stuck, you walk over there, unscrew the bottle, take a sip, put it back on, walk back. The, that is a huge difference. Okay. It, that is plenty of time for you to regain your space 99% of the times. Uh, and, and no one will think twice about it. Um, and if you keep going, you're going to get better. One of my friends, Paris, has Paris Robinson been on this podcast, Dennis? No. Okay. This dude is, um, did you listen to that pot? Did you listen to his show with Mike Bledsoe? I did. Yeah, I did listen to it. He, an amazing story. What the, the anybody out there complaining about anything in life needs to listen to this to this man on, on Bledsoe's podcast. I would love to have him on Building Men. I'll, I'll tell you about him. Yeah. Awesome dude. Unbelievable individual. I, I'll make. I can make that happen this afternoon. At least start the introduction. He, um, uh, Paris Robinson, was one of the kingpin heroin dealers in Richmond, which was the hardest city in the country at the time back in the mid and late 90s. And he got set up and shot four times in the sternum. Ouch. And laid in the bed for 18 months, quadriplegic. Um, and, and at the time, he was also on heroin when he was selling it. So he had this, it was a, it was a, it was a horrible scenario of getting shot, having this drug addiction, uh, and then things actually got worse from there. And I met him 
when he graduated from the healing place, which is a drug and alcohol rehabilitation program. And I watched him get up in front of an audience and hold everybody spellbound in their hand, in his, in his hand for two minutes, giving this story about Muhammad Ali and how, how you know, get up champ, the ground's no place for a, 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 a champ and and it was it was just it was incredible and i i thought my god that's the best natural storyteller i've ever seen anyway long story short i go meet with this guy and i'm like listen man this might sound weird and i know you, i know you don't know me and i want to help you speak and he goes speak about what i'm like speak about you man and i said the only thing i ask is that you say yes to everything that that, that, that i put in front of you and he's been on about 30 podcasts. He's in two documentaries now. He's a, he's a, uh, he helps people in recovery. He's doing fantastic. And uh, we, I went with him. I took him to his first 20, 20, 20 talks, 20 presentations in Richmond. And he said that when he gets off stage, it's better than heroin. This is where I'm going with this, folks. Getting on stage and having fun and being entertaining, it's such a high. It is such a high. And if you prepare, okay, if you, it, you're not spending, you're not taking, you're investing some time, and it really doesn't take much to get your show notes down on paper. You practice telling the story. You practice starting. You, pr you practice opening hot. Okay? And if you want to be super pro, you film yourself. You film yourself. You record yourself presenting before you go give your presentation, and then you watch it. And you're gonna hate hate life. You're gonna hate what you see. <laughs> and guess what you do? You give yourself one thing, one thing to make an improvement on, and then you re-record and watch it again. And you're gonna hate it again, but just a little bit less. Three times. I promise you this. If you rehearse, record, and watch it three times in a row, when you get on stage, you'll be the most prepared person there. And that will give you, when you know that you're well prepared, I mean, how good does that feel, gentlemen? Oh, it's night and day. Absolutely night and day. And the say yes to everything with Paris, that's chapter 22 in your book you, again you got in trouble for that many times yeah, yeah, that's how, many, how many men have said that to you before say yes to everything you're like oh, all right okay Shit. again here we, here we go, go. i i'm gonna beat that i'm gonna beat it like a dead horse today. that's <laughs> fine that's yeah what, there's always one thing that we end up and, uh, going on <laughs> so mark i want to i want to bring it to the those ancillary tips you just mentioned the, the recording and watching it back and i'll as a quick aside my experience going through the enlifted coaching level one cert basically what we have to do is is have a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with you for it seemed like four days it's an hour and a half but we go through the really really tough stories that we've been telling ourselves our whole life and we have to write them down and we have to tell the story to you we have to it's being recorded we have to tell this story to you and the first time that i told the story and the, my difficult story goes back to that bullying experience in middle school so i tell that story from from before it actually happened all the way through the conclusion of the story and, and how it started manifesting itself in my life moving forward so i tell the story it's maybe three paragraphs and i in excruciating detail spell out what happened in my life at that time and how i felt and my first time through i cried my eyes out i really broke down emotionally going through telling that story and at the end of the story you talked to me about how it felt. What were the feels? Well, you know, where did you feel it? You know, we, we went through and processed it. And then you say, okay, tell that story again at 70% speed. So yeah. I went back and I retold the story, but now I, I made it a little bit more intentional with how I over enunciated a couple words and maybe, you know, emphasize the period and the comma a little bit more. And I slowed down my rate of speech and it still was emotional, but not as emotional. I was able to take myself mm -hmm. out of the story a little bit. And because I was able to then see the words that I was saying rather than just, I knew what the words were and I just felt it in my chest. Then we go through and I take a deep breath after every single line. And by the time I get to the end of the story, 
now i you talk about it mark i moved the book away from my face it wasn't i wasn't a part of the story now i was observing something that happened that i am now i'm reading this a story so when you mention mark th that idea of, of recording yourself and doing it after that that one-on-one -on -one coaching session i needed to watch it back and look at me go through the process of telling the story over and over again and it was really challenging but what it did was help me understand one my rate of speech how often i was living in my chest when i was when i was speaking and not being more intentional about the way that i was speaking so it abs it was a transformative moment going through that it was difficult but it's so fucking important to watch yourself go through that uh, so I just wanted to give that quick aside um, before I ask this next question. You mentioned the water bottle, that, the little trick of the trade when you're, you know, when you're in that struggling moment. And we've all experienced it. Um, if we forget where we were going to say or where we were going or we look around the audience and see something that triggers us in one way, shape, or form. So besides that, is there any other strategy as far as, and I wrote a couple things down, um, up, I'm up on stage and say we'll do this in in a face to face capacity. I'm up on stage. What are we looking at? You know, where like even if we'll, we'll break it down to this really deep level, what am I looking at as I'm up on stage? Am I picking out a couple, you know, shills in the audience that I'm going to to look at? Am I scanning the audience? Am I, you know, making sure I make eye contact with every single person? What strategies do you have there? Pick out three, two or three, two or three people. Uh, different places in the in the audience and make solid good eye contact with them for a moment that's um that's a very tried and true uh, uh, presentation skill uh, uh tactic um and this this uh this might sound a little bit weird and it's real you want to lock your face into a certain position Okay, so I'll tell, I'll, I'll, I'll back into this with a story. About once I got good enough at telling the story of how our language influences us for better and for worse, because, and that right there, that's the through line of all the talks that I give. That is the, the one sentence. Everything else is detail, everything else supports that. Once I got good enough to where I had extra mental real estate. I didn't have to think about so much what I was saying. I got to focus on some of the little things as in how was I holding my face? It sounds weird. Yes. And when I was giving my best presentations and what I noticed is that, uh, my, my, the back of my head, the muscles in the back of my head were activated. And I'm like, that's interesting. I, and I also liked the way it felt. Okay. It softened my face. It softened my eyes because I used to get, I used to get this, this feedback folks. And I thought it was good. People would tell me, man, you're so, you're so intense up there. And I was like, yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. I'm intense. And then I figured out what they were really saying. I just took the IN off of it. You're tense. Like, that's not good. Uh, and, and so I started actively softening my physical body when I was, when, when I was presenting, getting relaxed, getting loose. Yes. The breath is a big part of it. And, uh, I, and, and, and so I had this way of, of, of holding my face. And so I get off stage at, at TEDx, and y'all can watch that. Fine, I'm saying it. I smashed that fucking talk. Uh, Eighteen hundred people in the in the in the audience. Uh, live stream to one hundred fifty thousand people. It's recorded. It's on the internet forever. No pressure. So I get off stage, uh, come down from the high, which took me about an hour. I get back in the audience and I'm watching people give their presentations. I'm like, this is cool, but it's not as cool as being backstage. So. I go backstage and there's a guy back there. He's a photographer, Puerto Rican photographer from New York City. And the dude is shitting bricks. He's up in like three minutes. And I go up to him and, and every and TEDxRVA, they're, they're fantastic. Shout out to them. 
everybody gets assigned a coach. So I go up to this, this guy and I go, I know you've got a coach and would you like some assistance? And he didn't say yes. He just looked at me wide eyed and nodded his head real big. And, and I said, turn around. And he turned around and everybody listening, y'all can do this. I took my fingers and I pinched the tops of his ears and I pulled up on the tops of his ears. And if you do that, it's going to activate the muscles in, in, in the back of your head, which pulls your forehead across instead of crinkling it like this. You want to stress yourself out, crinkle your forehead. Okay, it's going to activate a stress response and your breath is going to get trapped in your chest much more easily. If you do this, it'll pull your forehead across, it'll pull your eyes because a good smile starts with the eyes, everybody. Okay, and and I said, remember how this feels. Walk on stage, lock your face into position and deliver. He got out there and it was it was a little awkward for 30 minutes and he found his rhythm and he got off stage. He was the happiest guy in the fucking room. And so I'm telling this to one of my friends who's a high level, Jamie Clark from the yoga people, high level yoga teacher, teacher, they run uh, certifications. And I'm telling, I'm telling him like, I just breathe better when I do that. I feel better. It's like my whole body is connected. And he's just giving me this, this, uh, this, this wise nod, letting me get it all. And he goes, you know what you're, you know what that is? I'm like, no, he goes, that's the Buddha smile. He goes, when you activate that part of the back of your head, it relaxes everything down through your psoas, which allows you to breathe better. It, it, de, um, it de-stresses everything all the way through your posterior chain and out your big toes. So it, it, it unifies, uh, the entirety of your body and, and you can use that instrument, uh, uh, a, a, a lot better, um, that right there is, it, I know it sounds weird, and if you do that, you will actually feel your face activate in a certain way. So you want to use your body as an instrument. Not only is it the words that you're saying, it's the rate that you, uh, the rate that you use your words. It's, 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 you want to orchestrate the entirety of yourself to, one, educate, and two, entertain. And, and that's on their side. So and on your side of the street, here it is again. So you enjoy yourself up there. Okay. There is most people, like I said, are praying for confidence. Okay. They start insecure and they want to get confident. If you keep going and knowing that there's something past confidence, if you keep going, you're going to get into the promised land of presentation skills, which is comfort. When you are comfortable up there, okay, also, it's really hard to enjoy yourself doing well, damn near anything, when you're stressed and tense and tight. You get yourself loose and mobile and fluid and present, uh, then, then, then you're, you, that's, that's when you're, you're, at, you're at home on stage. And um, uh, it's, it's, like, like I said, Paris Robinson said it was the best drug he's ever gotten his hands on. When he gives a presentation in the evening, he doesn't sleep till 4 a.m. Because he's just he's, he's yeah. reviewing it and replaying it. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it is one of the very best skills that you can, you can acquire. And people think, and there's a misnomer about this, I, I think that people have the idea that you have to have the confidence to do or to act. It's you first. have to do and act and suck and do and act and get better. And that's where the confidence comes from, which is causing you to do more things. It's you have to it has to start with the step. It has to start with the doing, the movement, whatever it is. So now now Mark, we're back up on stage. You have the thing with the, the ears pulling back. I, I can't wait to take off the head. And I'm literally sitting out. here. I'm sitting here the whole time and I'm doing this yeah. as you're speaking. And I'm not even kidding. From the start of this podcast of right now. I feel myself becoming more grounded and calm in my surrounding area right here. And just with the power of storytelling, like to know that your voice is heard is so powerful. And Mm -hmm. my whole life going under the story that I'm not good at presenting, that I can't do it, that made me feel like I'm not heard by my peers and my voice doesn't matter. 
And so living my whole life like that has made me sick over the years that I'm, that nothing I say is important enough to be heard. And a lot of that came around presenting and that I wasn't good with that. And when I've done it, I feel like you said that high, like that just amazing euphoric feeling that you get from being able to be heard on stage and people understanding your message and you being able to articulate in a way that makes people understand and really gain that, you know, that, that message that you're trying to convey the whole time. And it's just, there's so much power in that. I really, it's amazing. And so now Mark, we're back up on stage, right? And, and, the fact that you're saying it, I, I've definitely seen a transformation in you, Anthony. In this is you're pretty much presenting when we're here in studio together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've just I've I've witnessed such a miraculous transformation with your presentation skills. It's night and day. It's really it's remarkable to to have a, a you know a passenger seat view on what's going on with you. And um, so, Mark, we're we're back up on stage now. We pulled our ears back, or we have that feeling in our head. And everybody who's listening, do that. Try it out right now and just see the difference in how it feels. So now, my next thing is just our physical, the physical space. I'm I'm a believer in go and see where you're going to be pre- presenting from. Mm-hmm. Stand up in that spot first. Look out <laughs> among the audience where they will eventually be. See where the steps are. Is there a chair here? Just to get an idea, and and then you can use that to visually build up in your head, you fucking nailing it. You want to see the whole environment first. Now you're up on stage, Mark. As far as just your physical space on stage, are you are we walking around a lot? Are we staying in one area? Do we speak and then walk? Do we walk when we're speaking? Just that that physical movement space on stage. What advice would you give to the audience around that? There's going to be um, you know some personal preference uh in in with that answer and you'll only know what your personal preference is after you've done the reps and you've you've explored that okay myself personally i love taking up space okay i love taking up space i love moving um i like getting big with my arms and my hands when necessary so what that does for me and, and and also i love um I, I love, like I mentioned earlier, the range, because there are certain people in the audience that you're going to capture with your excitement. And there are certain people in the audience that you're going to you're going to capture with those low, poignant moments that you let land with silence. That's, a, that's another part of this conversation. If you all want to master storytelling, you've got to master silence. And if you're going to master, there's only one way to master silence. You know, you've mastered it when you're comfortable with it. Silence is, you can use it strategically. This might sound strange. With all the other things that we've talked about, you include silence and you, you are literally the maestro of the audience. Okay. You're literally playing them. And you can you can ha- you can strategically put a pause in there, and with that just a little bit of silence, everybody tenses up, and then you start talking again, and you take them on another story, and they oh relax, and then you do it again, and they're like oh, and you just you 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 get you synchronize everyone in the audience, and by the end, if you've done that really well, I mean you know, that's that's when you start getting asked to go do other talks, and you get invited back. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, I I hope that answered your your question, Anthony. There's, there's also something that uh, all three of us can speak, um, about, you know, uh, Anthony, I, I I know you, um, uh, I know you just went and and did training camp for the soul. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Shout out to them. They're awesome. Dennis, you're doing in lifted. Okay. Those are, those are both two, um, ways, methodologies, paths of exploring our stories. You want to do that. You want to go into your story and clean up the identity components, the parts of you that think for, you know, the reasons that they do, think and feel you're not good enough or why would anyone listen to me? 
If you go into those stories and there are ways to do it, and in the Elliptid, we have our way of doing it. First and foremost, write the damn thing down. It's super easy, okay? And, and, and air it out. So the more of your story that you go in and, and, and own and process, um, the more, the, the less baggage that you'll have up there on stage. And the identity piece is absolutely huge, okay? The first time that I called myself a professional when it comes to speaking. We had just wrapped up, this is 2018, we just wrapped up um, Paleo Effects. I got on a red eye, flew into Richmond, and to, to give a 15-minute talk, they brought me in as the, 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 the funny guy, the, the guy that's going to bring the good message about the words to uh, what was a, a very dry weekend of, it was the Virginia Cable uh, service providers, their, their annual meeting. So all of the heads of the cable service providers from, from, from Virginia, they, 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 uh, they, they rented the biggest room in, in the, the Jefferson hotel, which is the nicest hotel in Richmond. And I, um, uh, I, I get brought in and, and, and unbeknownst to me and everyone else for two minutes, once a month, they run the fire alarm. To, to, to test them out. So I get up on stage, make sure they're working. I get up on stage and I'm, I'm delivering my presentation. Oh, and if you get really good at something, you get really good at presentation, presentation skills, even talks. Um, not only do you have that extra mental real estate to be funny, okay, to crack jokes, to go off on important tangents, you can also, um, you, you roll with the punches because sometimes weird stuff is going to happen. So I'm, I'm giving that presentation and halfway through the fire alarms go off. And the only thing I did, I kept all of the movements the same. I kept, because I was also, I had my face locked in a position. I didn't, I didn't do this and look around and like look for someone for help. No one's coming. Okay. One of the reasons I like, um, and Dennis, I'm going to, I'm going to touch on getting on stage before the actual event, because that's a very real thing. Um, uh, no one's coming up there. No one's coming to help you on stage. Okay, it's a lonely place. It's a beautiful place. It's one of the reasons I like it. Uh, the only thing I did was I raised my voice. I doubled the the the, the level of uh, uh, the the loudness of my voice and kept going. And as soon as the thing stopped, I dropped it back down to regular. Uh, normal, no, normal decibel, and uh, the 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 president came up to me afterwards, and he goes, "How did you do that?" And I I just looked at him and I go, "I'm a professional speaker," <laughs> and I just stared at him. And we we had a it was a it was a it was a second moment, like two 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 seconds of just a staring at it, and finally he just goes like that. So you will as you get better at anything, your confidence is built, folks, okay? Your confidence is built. It's built like anything else. And the stuff that you've gotten good at, your confidence has been built as you've gotten better and better at it. So what's the answer to that? Get better. Get just a little bit better. Prepare a little bit. The difference between having prepared a little bit and prepared not, not at all is huge. Pick up the pen. Write down what you want to talk about. Practice saying it. And go on walks, folks. Go on walks. So for the TEDx presentation, I rehearsed the entire presentation somewhere between 75 and 80 times. Okay? And 90% of those rehearsals I did on walks. I would go out and I would walk and I would tell certain segments of the story. Okay? Got the reps in. Um. Uh, and uh, uh, that is my favorite place. If I'm not recording myself, that's my favorite place to practice. And one thing that you can do that's very easy to help you slow down your rate of speech is to pick up a book and read slowly for five minutes. Okay? Do that right before you go on stage. Watch what happens. I... um. I love what you said about the um, the 
connection to the audience, Mark. And it's such a real thing. It's not as much about the content that you're delivering. It's about your ability to connect with the people that are sitting in front of you and to have them experience an emotional connection and journey that you're going on together. Whatever the, the content is, they will remember at such a deeper level because of that emotional connection that you're having. And it's something that I, I tell to teachers all the time and, and I tell to people that are going to be influencing the next generation. It's not about mm. the curriculum and the content. It's about the connection and helping students experience an emotional connection to whatever that topic is. If you, if you remember something, you remember something in, in such a deeper way if you have an emotional connection to that experience. So what you're doing is taking people on this emotional ride. And I, 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 I want to make sure that I get back to that idea of you rehearsing it going on walks. Mm. Another, another th just more of a um, practical strategy for presentations, people think they need to have everything scripted. So they need to write down every single word that they're going to say, memorize word by word, and then present word by word, or have a bulleted list next to them. What strategies do you have for people to who are going to be presenting something? Say they have a 30-minute presentation that they're going to give. Do you recommend knowing line by line every single word you're going to say or pick out a couple topics and be able to speak on each one of those topics for three to five minutes? Uh, I've done both. Um, believe it or not, it was a, it was a bold maneuver. Uh, with the TEDx talk, I, I've referenced that a lot because everyone can watch it. And it was, um, it was to date the most important presentation I've given for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, Adam Chin and I, we went back and forth. So I get a call, I get a text, I'm walking down Venice Beach Boulevard, uh, Venice Beach Boardwalk. I get a text on my phone, TEDx RVA wants you. I just look at the phone. I know what this means. It's an opportunity. It's a golden opportunity. And I just smile and I nod and I send Adam a text. He's in Thailand. And we get, we do this for a month. We go back and forth for a month, crafting the script down to the word. And so we picked a lane and I, I, I memorized that script down to the word. And I hit every word. It was a nine minute. When I think about it now, because <laughs> I rarely do that, when I think about that, I'm like, it actually freaks me out a little bit <laughs> because um, you got to get every word. It was, it was, it was, it was a song, you know, it was, a, it was a song that we were, we were, we were crafting. Um, now for me, and I do this, I gave a presentation to uh, yesterday morning. Uh, uh, 90 minutes on the, the fundamentals of, of, of the language game. And every time, whenever I'm presenting, I have to write out the bullet points of what I'm going to talk in order, talk about in order on a page until I get a certain feeling. And that certain feeling is directly correlated to uh, how, how my handwriting so the first time I write down my bullet points, it's all scribbly and scratched. And, and then 30 minutes later, I'll go back and I'll rewrite everything slower. So it's, 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 it's prettier handwriting. And then I'll do that again. And, and I'll know when I'm ready to present now. And this is stuff that I talk about all the time. I'll know when I'm ready to give that presentation. And it, it takes a, a very short amount of time when I get the feel, the, the, the centeredness. Um, and, and you, my preparation now is, is a lot less than it, than it used to be because I know the topic, I know the topic of the, 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 the topic of language and story work well enough. I know what stories I'm going to tell. Um, and, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a podcast coming up in January, Paul Check. Okay. That's also a, a, a huge opportunity. It will likely be the, the second most important podcast that we go on. And I'm going to talk about new material. 
which I'm excited about. I've given 200 and this is the 268th podcast. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm training for that one again. Okay. I'm reading new material. I'm taking notes. I'm getting ready for it. Um, and again, professionals, the, the, the main thing folks is professionals prepare amateurs. Don't if, if that's the only thing that you take away from this, this conversation today, then it was worth your time. And 10 minutes of preparation is, is it's a, it's the world was flat. Now it's round compared to no minutes. If you, if you practice, if you prepare, practice, script, record 10, 15 minutes a day, let's say you're presented Saturday today, it's not Saturday, it's Tuesday today, and you're presenting on Sunday. If you prepare just a little bit for five, five days in that five days, leading up to that six days, you're going to do fantastic. Okay. And then if you want to be super pro, go back and watch your presentation. That's the professionals do this. Professionals watch tape, tape of the, and any, and football, fighting, golf, whatever, critique yourself. You got to get over yourself, everybody. You've got to get over yourself. One of the fastest ways to do that is to watch tape on yourself. A buddy of mine, is, remember what podcasts were like in 2011? It was the it was the it was the dawn of the podcast. Okay, my buddy, his wife Chinese, she um, she specialized in import export. Uh, he bought these huge drums of tea. Chinese tea and all these Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese tea accoutrements and the, the tables and the, the pots and all this stuff. And he goes, I'm going to do a podcast. All right. And we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to drink tea while we're doing it. Um, uh, he's a big martial arts fan still is. He's like, I want to talk about martial arts and other cool stuff. And at the end, I'm going to sell my tea. I said, that's a fantastic idea. I'll be your first guest. And you know how many podcasts he did? You know why? He never got over himself. He didn't like the sound of his own voice. Who likes the sound of their own voice when they first hear it? Okay. Who likes the way they look on on camera the first time they get on camera? You you, you gotta you you have to raise your immunity to yourself. Okay. So you're not giving yourself these nasty identity personality judgments, and you're critiquing the delivery. Okay, watching tape. I'm hammering this point on purpose. It's so important. It's so important. And recapping everything that you told us, Mark, I think this is a great script. Anybody who's going to be giving a presentation anytime in the near future, we want to make sure that we're presenting, uh, uh, preparing. Like professionals will prepare, even if it's for a short period of time. We want to write it down. We want to make sure that we're putting everything pen to paper, understanding it, instead of coming in and, hi, my name is. Slim Shady. I should add a little more, a little more of a, <laughs> a little more of a pause on there. But again, I'm I'm comfortable with that. I, I know. But having a hot opening, having something that will draw the audience in, not a very passive thing, and it's something that I'm working on as well with the podcast. I don't like the way the beginning sounds, so I want it to be more of a hot open each time. And yep. it's such an important part where people are like, "Oh, I I need to." tune in right away because there's something good coming up right away we want to make sure that we are uh slowing down our rate of speech and part of that is listening back to us going through the process and and really being critical of ourselves as well and being okay with the fact that we might suck in the beginning we'll yeah. get better at it to breathe through it and so the, the breath is not trapped in our chest the breath is low and slow in everything we're doing to focus on one main thing and have supporting ancillary details. But it's one journey that we're bringing the audience on. When we're actually up on stage, just those little nuanced things, we want to be cognizant of the way our face is, the angle of our face. You know, you mentioned pulling back on our ears, using our hands and our feet in unison. We want to make sure that we're being cognizant of our nonverbal communication. And then when we're looking out at the audience to pick out two or three people that we will focus on and really lock eyes on. And don't be afraid to let silence sit there for a little, little bit. It's okay if people are like, I wonder what he's going to say next. That's exactly what the fuck we want. We want them to say, I wonder what he's going to say next. And as we're getting towards the end of it, to have that emotional closing, 
nothing that we're going to break down and blubber through, but something that will leave an impact on the audience in that emotional way. And I think about, too, to, to bring it back to the topic of the one-on-one coaching call, if I were to tell, I would feel confident telling that story as a close now because I have enough mm. space from that story where Three weeks ago, a month ago, telling that story, I would break down every single time. It, that wouldn't be a story that I would be able to tell as a closure to a presentation. Now, I'm able to do it. So if there is that emotional close that you want to have, you have to work through the story intentionally. So you are not that kid, that person in the story. You are able to tell it from an outsider's perspective. Like This is something that happened to a 12-year-old Dennis. Um, so that's kind of summing it up. I, hopefully I, I nailed all the points Great that you summarization. had. Great um, summarization. Summarization. And then the final thing is the the um, the Richmond cable providers. They throw a fucking party from what I could. Uh, that's what it those people like. are like no joke. We want, we got to get down to the Richmond cable providers <laughs> conference. Wild. In Rich- wild, <laughs> wild, wild asses. Time. Wild. Best 15 minutes you'll spend. And even if two of them are under the duress of, of the fire alarm going off. Worth it. <laughs> So it's all worth it. <laughs> worth it. Totally. So, uh, so, so, Mark, tell us where we can yeah. find you, what you're doing. We, we, the Building Men audience is enamored by you. You were the, the guru of the enlisted coaches. We've had so many enlisted coaches on. Everyone's doing their own little thing, but you are, you're the, the straw that stirs his drink with the enlisted coaches. So tell us a little bit about where we can find you. Enlifted.me. Uh, that is a, uh, uh, a link to... Uh, our site specifically on the certifications. There's a right now. There's a five minute video. We're putting up a new site here. December first is the due date. And right now, five minute video. What it is, a way to contact us. Um, it's a it's a way of helping people dismantle the, the 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 stuckness in their story, so they have more flow, so they can have more fun, so they can breathe better. Another way to say it, we help uh, we help coaches. Uh, dismantle their clients victim mentalities so they get them get themselves out of the way you know through the art of storytelling you know if we if we looked at the the, the certification through the lens of storytelling it's storytelling we're telling stories we're we're uh, uh, we're, we're addressing stories that have held uh, negative God knows how long and and just and it's making more free people you know so you can go out there and and, and be more of you more easily okay more self-expressed more heard more heard and, and appreciated by yourself first and foremost and then you deliver that to the the, the people around you uh and um yeah on on instagram marking on 2057 it's a it's a free language training school uh mixed in with a little little a little bit of comedy here and there um uh, uh, I just posted something from Oscar Wilde this morning. He said, if you're going to tell people the truth, make them laugh because otherwise they'll kill you. <laughs> I want to, I want to take some of my, my own medicine and, and, and leave y'all with something. It was the last thing of importance that was said to me before I went on stage, uh, on, on TEDx and it's very true. And it, 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 it settled the last nerve that I had going up there uh, this friend of mine, Jenny Jenny McMurphy, uh, she lives in Australia. She she said, "Mark, I just want you to know that the audience is rooting for you." And I'd never heard that before. And I thought about it. And I'm like, you know what? They are because they are. Anybody that gets up on stage, that is a bold act. And most people would pay not to get up on stage and give presentations. So they're rooting for you. Okay. They are your friends, um, and 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 keep that in mind when you get up there and present and go on podcasts because it uh, it'll 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 help create that extra bit of connection. Absolutely, brother. Final words. Well, I challenge the building man audience to go back if you didn't have a pen and paper during this listen talk, listen. go back and listen to it again and start taking notes on this stuff because that was. Probably the most valuable podcast I think that we've done. Um, I have nothing to say. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, usually we, we leave. Because um, normally it's like, oh, let's. what are some things you could do? Dude, he just, just gave you about 50 fucking right. things to do. Exactly. So if you didn't do that and didn't take any of them, then that's on you. So yeah. I. that's it. 
go back and listen to this podcast again without a doubt for the building men audience a couple things uh find us on instagram building.men our website buildingmen.io buildingmencoach at gmail.com visit our sponsors finish the race apparel ftrapparel.com become stronger industries they create handmade badass steel maces and um as far as the enlisted coaches go i will be getting my certification uh graduation day is in uh december so if, if that if, if that is of interest to you if you're a building men fan have, have made a connection to me or to my brother reach out if you're interested in going through that journey as a as a client going through the enlisted coaches program mark england has been a, an absolute pleasure um you are uh, a friend a mentor a guide on my professional journey as well i truly appreciate you being here on on building men we we'd love to have you on for your 300 and 350th 400 episode mm -hmm. down the road because uh, the everything that you do is pure gold my man dennis anthony thank you for having me on fellas uh and and congratulations on your success you know i um i'm making that introduction to lauren peters uh today and and i got on your instagram and i took a picture and last time i I looked, you you all are like 6,000 followers, and this, today you're over 15,000. Great job, fellas. Straight up. Great job. Appreciate that, my man. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. Building Men audience, go a step further than you thought you can go today. We'll see you next time on Building Men.